conversation. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Terrell Page, and I'm the Director of Advocacy and External Initiatives for the National Black Law Students Association. I would like to thank you to all of our panelists for joining us this evening. We have some very distinguished individuals here to discuss the topic, socially and civically engaged empowerment through advancement. And so what does that really mean? It means that we as attorneys have incredibly valuable skills to affect change in our communities, to bring people together and to really make a difference. And so this evening, we have several panelists who I will look forward to hearing from very soon, but I would like to introduce briefly. So I would like to start with Ms. Shakisha Robinson. And Shakisha is the Director of Social Policy and Advocacy and Black Public Defender Association, the Deputy Chief of Prisoner and Reentry Legal Services at the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia Community Defender Division. And she is a transformational leader. And Ms. Robinson manages a team of attorneys who respond to the legal and social service needs of newly released individuals and other with DC criminal records, assisting them in making a successful transition back into the community. Further, she sub she serves as the Public Defender's Service Liaison to individuals convicted of District of Columbia Code offenses. Before joining the CDD, Ms. Robinson was a senior attorney in the Public Defender Service Trial Division, handling only the most serious felonies. Ms. Robinson is also the co-chair of the DC Reentry Action Network, a coalition of Reentry Direct Service Providers and the co-chair of the ABA's Committee on Reentry and Collateral Consequences. She is also the Director of Social Policy and Advocacy for the Black Public Defenders Association. She is especially passionate about mentoring the next generation of advocates and does so by teaching criminal law as an adjunct professor at George Washington University. She received her law degree from Boston College Law School and her undergraduate degree, magna cum laude, from the Commonwealth Honors College at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Ms. Robinson has an enduring commitment to the District of Columbia, where she has passionately served people with DC criminal records in both the pre and post adjudication phases of the criminal justice system for many years. Ms. Robinson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Page, for that wonderful welcome. Of course, it's only because you have done such wonderful work that I'm able to el uh, eloquate what you have done. I'd like to introduce our next guest, State Representative Jasmine Crockett, who serves the House District Number 100 and sits on the Dallas and Mesquite Committees, the Business and Industry and Criminal Jurisprudence Committees. Jasmine Crockett is a state representative, civil rights and criminal defense attorney, and proud lifetime member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. And she's currently running to be the next Congresswoman in Texas 30. Representative Crockett earned her BA in business administration from Rhodes College and her JD from the University of Houston. She is licensed to practice law in Texas, Arkansas, and the federal courts. Representative Crockett is the previous Bowie County Democratic Party chair, holds various leadership positions within the legal community, and is a former board member of the Dallas County Metro Care Services. As I said previously, she sits on the business and industry, criminal jurisprudence, and the da uh, Dallas Mesquite committees in the Texas State House. And from the courtroom to the Capitol, Representative Crockett has never lost sight of the people. She has been a voice for thousands of Texans. She represented over 5,000 Texans in court, including over 400 peaceful protesters whom she represented pro bono. Representative Crockett has served as a public defender and is the former president of the Dallas Black Criminal Bar Association. And as I said, she is currently running for Congress to take her proven fighting spirit 
to Washington, D.C. Representative Crockett, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And finally, I'd like to introduce Ms. Stephanie Amwako. And Ms. Stephanie Amwako is a Senior Policy Associate at Accountability Council in Washington, D.C., where she implements strategies to strengthen accountability mechanisms for human rights harms caused by internationally financed projects. Ms. Amwako has extensive experience in international human rights advocacy around the world. Prior to joining the Accountability Council, she was at the Public International Law and Policy Group in Washington, D.C., and supported advocacy for trans transitional justice mechanisms in South Sudan and the creation of alternate justice mechanisms to address post-election violence in Kenya. Ms. Amwako's experience also includes work with the Research Center on Labor Relations and Inequality in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and UNDP Maldives. And she's currently a member of the Center for Strategic and International Studies Africa Policy Accelerator Program. Ms. Amwako has an international degree in compar international comparative studies from Duke University and a JD from Columbia Law School and a Master's of International Relations from Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. She also holds an LLM in criminal law from the University of Amsterdam. Ms. Amwako, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here with the other great panelists. I'm so excited to get really right dive right into our conversation and talk about civic engagement and really i'd like to start with our first question and ask all of our panelists how did you get to where you are today in your career and really what if any obstacles did you face that black law students might encounter and how did you either overcome or move around or maneuver those obstacles. And since I introduced you last, Ms. Almarco, would you like to get us started there? Sure, thank you so much, uh, Terrell. So um, I focus, my work uh, focuses on human rights harms caused by um, infrastructure projects and other projects um, financed by international financiers. And my parents are immigrants from Ghana, and as a result, I've always had an interest in global issues, which I think is why I'm, I'm working so deeply in them right now. Um, in law school, I focused on human rights issues as well as governance and rule of law development, so uh, helping to build structures in various countries um, to advance justice. Um, one of my particular areas of focus was how communities can seek justice for human rights harms outside of the court system, as oftentimes courts can be um, inaccessible for the most vulnerable. And so I've taken that work throughout my career. Um, as for obstacles, although my parents do have uh, graduate degrees, I was the first lawyer in the family, so it was a little bit difficult understanding what I was uh, supposed to be doing in law school, um, you know, what the, the different steps were. I think that was even more compounded by the fact that I wanted to do um, maybe a more non-traditional uh, route of human rights um, advocacy. And what really helped me was that uh, connecting with practitioners who are actually doing the type of work that I wanted to do. Um, so they could tell me what experience would be helpful, like um, working abroad or, or language classes, as opposed to maybe the more traditional lawyering that uh, could be helpful, but it's not necessarily like uh, being on a journal or, or, or other things like that. Um, and so I think finding other like-minded people is really important and uh, finding your path and, and, and sticking to it is also important. Thanks. And that's, you know, like-minded people is exactly the idea of this association and of what we're doing here tonight. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, Representative Crockett, do you have any thoughts on that question as to obstacles and how you got here today? Yeah, so first of all, um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I may not look excited, I'm quite tired. Uh, <laughs> we just had our first round of this race where I have eight opponents uh, 
And we did it on March 1st and I was at 49%. (laughs) So now I have to do a whole runoff um, because I didn't quite make it. So staying really busy, but uh, I want to tell you something that most people don't tell you, which is don't stress. Um, something that I'm doing all the time. But, you know, a lot of people or some people, at least in your class, you know, they walk in, they know exactly what they're going to be. They know exactly how they're going to get there. And I mean, their life has been set out for them since they were brought into this world. And then there are those of us that go through like the normal people. Um, And I won't hate on the panelists if this wasn't their experience where you go through kind of this shock of, oh, Lord, what am I going to do? Or you have to deal with Um, sorry, there's a congressman calling me right now. Um, Or you have to deal with people, you you know, feeling like I've got to have it all planned out. Number one, the biggest obstacle that I typically see, especially when it comes to law students, are are you yourselves, right? Um, Because to put yourself in this type of environment, you really set the bar really, really high for yourself. And so you've got these high standards, right, that you're going to make the six figures or whatever it's going to be, right? Like you've got these goals. So the thing is, I did not know that I would be headed to Congress at 40. Um, I actually am a trial lawyer. I love trials, like beyond belief. And it took me about three months to even consent to running for Congress because I have to give up practice in law, which just like kind of rips out my heart. Um, But I have worked as a public defender. Um, So I got my PD sister here and you know, when I went into law school, I said I would never do criminal law because, well, I thought somebody would try to kill me if I messed up. So I was like, I don't want to do it. But that's where I ended up. And I, I kind of went with where my heart was. So I just want to impress upon you to number one, not be your own obstacle. Number two, when someone is literally there um, reaching out saying, hey, I'm willing to help you take it especially if it's someone who is a seasoned attorney and don't let that person go. Um, One of my mentors to this day uh, is an older judge. Even now I have called him as I'm running for Congress years later and I'm asking him questions, but he was one of my best allies. And a lot of times having those mentor relationships, you never know what they are doing in back doors or, or back rooms for you on your behalf. Um, and promoting you. And so it's important that people know who you are. Don't just stay in a little bubble um, because that is you beginning to build your village and you will face obstacles. Um, I worked out in East Texas. East Texas tends to be a little less uh, colored, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, literally I was the only black female attorney in the town. And so, you know, I had I had normal problems, right? Like, you know, America problems. Um, I had those, but I had these really great relationships and these mentors and these people that made sure that we that I did what we always are told that we have to do, which is I had to be better than everybody else. And that's exactly what I did. Um, And so finding and creating those relationships and just not putting all the pressure on your shoulders to figure it out. Um, I am still figuring out life um, at this moment, especially when it comes to my legal career. But don't worry about the money is the other thing that I'm going to say is don't let that be an obstacle. Because if you fall into your passion, the money will come. I promise you. Um, It will absolutely be there. You will be taken care of. But you don't want to end up in a situation where you signed up for the money, but you hate what you do. If you went to law school, I hope that it's because you have a passion about something and it involves helping somebody, Um, whether it is the human rights violations, whether it is those um, that are stuck in a criminal injustice system or whether it uh, is just the elderly, whoever it is, or whatever it is that drove you to go to law school, don't ever lose sight of what got you there, what drove you there, and make sure you hold on to that passion and that fire and keep pressing no matter how hard it seems like it's getting sometimes. That There's so much that I would like to say about that, but I think, you know, the current theme of us being better connected and leaning on each other as a village and as a community, I'm already kind of sensing that as a theme of this conversation. But I would like to hear from our last panelist, Ms. Robinson, 
with your thoughts on that question as to the obstacles and how you got here and what's how do we fix it and overcome it all? Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Terrell, and thank you. It was great listening to Stephanie and um, Jasmine's um, stories. <clears throat> I was recently in a meeting and someone said, if you know, they like to start with icebreakers. And they said, if you could tell your high school self something, what would you tell your high school self? And I'm gonna go with that, but I'm gonna say my law school self. And I would tell my law school self, do not count yourself out because you don't know the outcome. You don't know the outcome. You don't know where you're gonna be in five years, 10 years, 15 years. I'm now 17 years out. I was you at one point in these same meetings, listening, holding on to every word, hoping I could have insight for my life, not knowing what I was gonna do, not having it all mapped out, sometimes suffering from imposter syndrome. How did I get here in the first place? How did they let me in? Is somebody gonna realize what happened? What is the plan? And what I am telling you is, don't lean into that. Lean into the process. Lean into what Rep Crockett said, mentors. There are people who've already been there. They've already done it. They can see your future five and 10 years ahead. It's okay if you cannot. Your job and your responsibility is to do law school well, as well as possible. And that doesn't just mean get good grades. Doing law school well means making connections now, forging relationships now, getting mentors now, creating bonds now, making mistakes now, learning from those mistakes now because all of those things are going to inform your future outcome that you don't know of yet. When I went to law school, and it wasn't even my plan to go to law school, hey, lawyers and doctors, that's for other people. That's not for me. But I saw strife in my community. I saw pain, and I knew I wanted to do something with it, and I didn't know what that was. And I was told, if you want to make any change in this country, you need a law degree. I didn't have all the answers. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I went. I followed the path. And when people poured into me, I allowed them to pour into me. I come from a community in Boston, Roxbury, all Black community. And I had a passion about criminal justice criminal legal system reform. My major in college was criminal justice, but I didn't need to necessarily go work in criminal justice. Also, I didn't see myself as a litigator. That's for other people who want to get up and talk. I'm about to jump on this real estate boom and get this money, and I'm going to take real estate. I took a bunch of real estate classes and wanted to shoot myself in the head. I then took the criminal defense clinic and it changed my life. I used to run track for anybody on this call who used to play a sport. I used to run the 200 and when you pass somebody on the curve, right in that moment, when you see them in your side view, you get a high, there's a high that comes with it. That was the high that I got when I was in court. That was the high that I got when I was in trial, when I was in the, my community, the community that raised me investigating cases, fighting on people's behalf. And by then my 3L year, I had a firm offer because I worked at a firm my second summer. I had an offer in hand and I had a passion in my heart and I had to make a choice. I had to make a decision. And like Rep Crockett said, it's not about money because it's your why that's gonna get you up every day. It's your why. Everyone said, oh, black excellence, black excellence. Black excellence takes work in dedication, in perseverance, in sleepless nights. If your why is not crystal clear to you, you're gonna struggle along that journey. And so I let people encourage me, mentor me. I followed my heart and I applied to be a public defender. 
And when the choice came, when I had to make that choice by that December, I followed my heart. And my answer to the struggles along the way were friends. Friends now, these friends that you're making now, all my friends are big time lawyers now, my friends from law school. We didn't know it back then. We were just struggling, trying to learn Panoia v. Neff and get somebody's outline. But now we've all made it. So that's going to be you if you just trust in the journey and allow people to pour into you. Thank you so much for that. And thank you once more for mentioning friendship and the power of networks, because that provides me into a perfect segue into my next question, which I would actually like to direct to Ms. Amwaku. And so we see everything that's going on around the world. You have what's going on in Ukraine and that gets all the attention right now, but that over, well, let's say it minimizes the conflicts and strife around the world because so many communities around the world are experiencing trouble and they need to be more connected. So considering your background, I, we wanted to know what does empowerment look like when it comes to those issues of a global scale? How can engagement transcend borders and bring us together, not only as a community of Black law students here in America, but as a community of people around the world? Thank you so much for that question. I think it's a really uh, great question um, considering all the challenges that um, everyone's facing right now. So at Accountability Council, we support communities, um, as I mentioned, who have been negatively impacted by various projects. These can be mining projects, um, agribusiness projects, et cetera, and the types of harm that they um, are suffering include environmental damage, damage to water sources, displacement from their land, um, gender violence, et cetera. Um, and so with our work defending uh, or helping communities defend their human and environmental rights, we see that a lot of issues are global. Um, for example, shrinking civic space is now very difficult um, for people to even raise their voices when it comes to um, a project that could be affecting them or a law that could be affecting them. Um, we're even seeing that now in, in various parts of, of Russia, those who want to speak out against the war, they, they can't. Um, also, there are issues around human rights defenders, people being actually killed for, for their, their advocacy. Um, my, my work involves seeing a lot of impacts from unjust corporate practices. And that is definitely something that is, is happening all over the world. And so as a result of the global connections with a lot of these harms, um, at our work at Accountability Council, we often collaborate with civil society groups in different countries and regions to see, um, A, how can we learn from each other, but then also how we can um, work with each other and push collectively. And as a US-based advocate, um, I, I feel like I have a particular role and um, I also have certain privileges that my colleagues around the world don't have. And so I try to use those privileges to uh, the advantage of the larger movement. Um, and I do this work by A, ensuring that um, I'm amplifying the voices of those who are most directly affected by these issues. So um, I always joke that one of the, the problems with DC is that uh, too often there are a lot of people sitting around just making up policies, but don't have really a connection to what the, the challenges were, are and what the solutions are. And um, communities know what the solutions are for their own communities. So um, having that connection with advocates around the world is very important for my work. Um, but two, I, I use my proximity being in DC to, um, to the advantage of our collective movement. So Congress is there. Um, I deal with institutions that are financing a lot of the projects that are causing harm, like um, the World Bank and, and other institutions. So I'm able to advocate to them. Um, Treasury Department, other stakeholders, uh, corporations as well. Um, so using my position in the US um, to open doors that maybe my colleagues in other countries uh, wouldn't have. And so those are just some reflections on, on the global movement. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Ms. Robinson, do you have any thoughts on that previous question? Yes, thank you for asking, Terrell. You said my favorite word. My favorite word is empower. Literally, I just wrote a 900 page book about empowering yourself. And I'll put that in the chat. I often tell people, we are who we've been waiting for. Stop waiting for the person to come in on a white horse and save you. This is in your personal life, your professional life. It's you. If you get lost, look in the mirror. I think everyone needs superhero songs. I had a lot of them, especially as a trial attorney. I used to listen to Fabulous. He would say, woke up out the bed, turn my swag on, take a look in the mirror, say what's up. It's you. You are the answer. I'm glad that Terrell mentioned Ukraine. Ukraine, yes, they're asking for help, but does it look like they're waiting? No, they're not playing games, right? The people of Ukraine are using every resource at their disposal to fight for themselves, to fight for their lives. And so much of the oppression that happens in systems is that someone else has structural, systematic power over you, right? But when you take that power back, it makes all the difference. How do you first access power from education and information? The fact that you're in law school, you've empowered yourself, right? And that same concept needs to be applied to communities. What's that favorite line, um, famous line? Well, give a person a fish and they eat for a day, teach them how to fish and it's a wrap. You teach me how to fish, I'm done. I'm getting a boat. I'm getting a company. I got people working for me. We selling fish. That's the answer. Empower yourself and then pay it forward and empower others. Because what I find is there's always a, a through line, right? There's always somebody you need to go through to get the information because that keeps them empowered. But if you get it for yourself and this applies to yourself and it applies to communities, then that's how you make change. That's the secret, empowerment. Thank you, Terrell. No, thank you for that, because I think that leads me directly into my next question, which I'd like to pose to Representative Crockett, because we're gonna take it now from the global scale back to local, because as someone I know and hold dear said to me, all politics is local. And so I'm sure you know that, Representative Crockett. And I really wanna know, what empowerment looks like on that local neighbor to neighbor community scale and how can law students affect those issues in their micro universe that's around them and then I also would like you if you could address what could that look like in different places are there does that empowerment look different in a place like New York or Chicago versus a place like Texas and if you could just kind of maybe opine on that. Yeah, so um, this is such a, a great lead in. So it's interesting um, that you bring this up. So when we think about local politics, so often people think, oh, well, it's just right here and it's just my little area. And I wanna show y'all the power of what happens on the local level. When you look at the state of Texas, um, the legislature did some crazy things uh, my governor was in the news, still is in the news, for a lot of drama that he caused. And so as I was sitting in the state capitol, constantly fighting him, or when we left the state capitol and went to the national capitol to fight him there, um, in my mind, like we got caught in our bubble. It was the bubble of the legislation that's coming through Texas. But what we soon saw is that what affected Texas was going to spread like a cancer throughout this country. And it was going to affect Florida, Georgia, Arizona, Missouri, and the list goes on. And so when you think about what it took to take away women's rights, it took one, I would say little state, but we're not really little, but it took <laughs> one of the many states to just say, hey, we want to get rid of women's rights, right? When, it, when we looked at voting rights, it was the same thing. And a lot of these bills and these ideas were actually born, especially when we look at CRT. CRT was starting at these very local, lower level, um, like school boards and these 
teachers that were upset about how, or these suburban moms that were upset that little Johnny had to learn that, you know, they come from races, you know, upbringings. But anyway, nevertheless, something like that was born there. And then it spread to say the school board. And then it spread from the school board to the state. And now it's spreading nationally, right? And so I want you to understand, even though no one thinks of the lower level as uh, all the glamour and glitz, that's really where it all happens. And that's where the people are. Because even me now trying to go to DC, one of my biggest issues was I didn't want to leave my constituents. Um, And even then I was going to Austin and I was, you know, I'm very close to them. But, you know, how many people are really going to talk to me in DC? I got to make the effort to talk to them, right? But when it comes down to like your school boards and your city council, they are right here. They are, I mean, they don't have anywhere else to go. (laughs) I'm sure they wish they could. And so it's important that you get involved on the ground level because just like bad policies have spread we can have good things that spread as well. And it starts, it's almost like when you think of, um, you know, faith being the faith of a mustard seed, right? That's what it is. It is that small spark that can change a nation. And I know it, you know, theoretically, it sounds like, oh, that's just one of them things that people say. But let me tell you something. Somebody decided that they wanted to do evil by us. And when I say us, I mean, people of color and people that are struggling socioeconomically, when it came down to something like voting rights. And when we think about the movement that was the response, we had a a, a movement that started with some preachers and and the the local activists that spread and became a national movement to the extent that they worked themselves all the way up to President Lyndon B. Johnson. And so I want you to understand that you don't start at the top. You always start, I hate to say the bottom, you always start with the people and the people are local and and there's so much that you can lend to these conversations if you go out and you start with your activism and and your advocacy at that level because you understand how these laws will affect most people better than they do. And when we think about our working families, they don't have the privilege and the benefit of going and sitting when city council is debating whether or not they're gonna raise the minimum wage or when they're talking about things like the Crown Act locally that's where we actually start to make the changes on the local level. So I just encourage you all to help out, especially because on the local level, a lot of times, depending on how large the city or the municipality or the county is, they may not have the resources to be able to do the research and things like that. And there's so much that you can learn about policy and begin to shape policy. If you just say, hey, this is what I'm going to do because I hate the way that the system treats people that look like me. So it takes us getting into the system itself to dismantle it and make it work for all of us. I think that you've <clears throat> you said something work for all of us. Thank you. You guys are really thank you for making my job easy tonight with the great segues. It's great making for a great panel so far. Because I'd like to come back to Miss Robinson. And when we talk about all of us. You know, we oftentimes talk about the Black community as a monolith, as if we all want one thing. And that's not the case. We have rich Black people and poor Black people and urban Black people and rural Black people and such a wide variety of interests within our community. So how, my question is, how can we be mindful to reflect all of those issues? Is it a balancing act? Is it, you know, just being specific? Do you have any thoughts on that? I do. Talk about perfect segue. As I was looking at this beautiful melanin on this call, I was thinking to myself, and it goes directly to your question, I hope the students are taking in the diversity of the professions on this call, the diversity of the leadership on this call. Remember when I said, you don't know the outcome. I don't know Rep Crockett's entire history, but at one point, she was a public defender. At another point, she's a local politician. She had to run first and she ran, and then she won. And now she's talking about, take me to the Capitol. I just gotta change this whole thing from the top down. We got, 
Um, Miss Amarco, I hopefully I said that right, because I know people always butcher my name. And she's doing environmental justice, global justice. She's worldwide. I always say East Coast, West Coast, and worldwide. She's worldwide. You may not go to law school and even she's in, where, where were you, Brazil? She, you know, she's making change around the world. You go to law school and so often it's firm, public defender, prosecutor. Oh, and civil legal aid. And those four things get recycled. There's a whole world out there. That's one of the biggest things I wanted to share with law students. And I mentor a lot of law clerks. And one of the things that I pour into them, we have a conversation just on all the kind of jobs out there that they're not aware of. So from your position of power, extends how you impact the world. So to the point, Terrell, that you're saying we're not a monolith, I'm helping people on the ground, in the streets, as they're, you know, in the criminal legal system. You got Rep Crockett, who's, who's all of your issues, I'm dealing with them. And then you have Ms. Amarco, who's doing worldwide. So in that point, you are, and then if we have a firm lawyer on here, they might be making sure your money's okay and making sure your wills and estates is okay, and your mergers and acquisitions are okay. So we are touching and impacting and influencing and persuading black people all around the world from our positions of influence. And if nothing else, you got that just from watching this panel. And I think that it was just divine intervention that I was chosen to moderate this particular panel because I so happened to be a dual degree student getting an degree in international relations with an interest in criminal justice who works for a state politician. I mean, it really couldn't have been more kismet if, it try, if I tried. And so I really would like to use this opportunity to narrow down specifically with Ms. Amwaku on two words, accountability and transparency. I'm sure there are two that you're very familiar and so I wanna say, I wanna ask, what is the importance of transparency to achieving social and civic empowerment? You know, I'll let you answer that question and then we'll rope in accountability on it. Sure, thank you. Um, so I think to answer this question, uh, an example from our work would be really on point, but I think transparency is, is everything. You can't um, exercise your rights or, or push back against corporate or, or government actions if you don't even know what's going on. And so I think transparency is crucial. Um, but to give you a concrete example, we are supporting communities in Haiti. Um, they were farmers and one day they went to their farmland and saw that someone had put up um, a fence around their farmland and had started raising down their crops. And what had happened was that um, in the Inter-American Development Bank, USAID, and a few other financiers had financed an industrial park. Um, and that industrial park had taken the land of the farmers to build the park. Um, the Haitian government, rather, had done that to build the park. And um, these farmers obviously did not know that this was happening, um, given that the land was taken so suddenly. And the amount of compensation that they received was so little. Um, and so what we did is that we've helped them um, use what is called a non-judicial accountability mechanism um, that is at the Inter-American Development Bank um, because it financed the project to raise concerns about how this project has been implemented and to try to get um, some justice for that. Um, through that complaint process, the communities entered into an 18 month uh, dispute resolution process where they sat down, mediated with the Haitian government and the Inter-American Development Bank, and was able to reach an agreement on replacement land, support for livelihoods, um, job training, educational support, some other, um, some other provisions. And so in my line of work where we're dealing with people who um, are being impacted by decisions that are often happening so far from them. Um, transparency is key. Communities need to know what's happening in their backyard. Um, and also talking about the global, local um, 
connection. The same thing is happening in the United States. We have the Dakota Access Pipeline Project. Um, we know that there are activists that are, are pushing against chemical plants in Louisiana. So these are, are indeed very global issues. Um, but we in our, in our area pushing for transparency and then accountability also says um, doing robust due diligence before a project goes forward, um, having consultations with communities to see what their priorities are, what, are, what their desires are, giving them the opportunity to reject the project if need be. Um, and then if all that does happen, providing, uh, and something still goes wrong, providing remedy at the end of the day so that communities are not left on the hook um, for these projects. And I think the, the global vision is not that infrastructure shouldn't happen or, or various projects shouldn't happen, but it's how it's done. Is it being done transparently? And is it done um, keeping the communities that are most impacted by these decisions in mind? Um, so that's what transparency and accountability uh, means for me in my work. I think you touched on some really important issues there, particularly our ability to help people seek redress in instances, you know, I always like to talk about creative lawyering because that sounds like creative lawyering when the government comes and takes your farm to then go and use the mechanisms in the funding of that particular project. And that is really, the that's a, one of those moments where it's the devils are in the details and you're able to make a change by utilizing a specific process to get to the goal that you want. I'm gonna use that as a segue to ask Representative Crockett, you know, as a lawmaker in Texas, I'm sure that there are a lot of processes that are not perfect, that are kind of set up to make change and empowerment more difficult. So can you speak specifically, you know, to your experiences as a lawmaker, to how some of those processes have, been established and how we can kind of help break them down in order to effectuate change. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really going to start a lot bigger and a little bit more globally um, so that it applies to anyone that's listening, no matter where you live, instead of being so specific to the Texas House. And I'm going to talk about redistricting and how that is one of those systemic issues that is causing us problems, it caused us problems back in the day, it's causing us problems now because what we see like in the Texas house and potentially what we're about to see in the US house is not going to be a real reflection of the representation or a real representation of who we are because they have played games um, to where they are silencing the voices of usually black and brown folk. And so it's interesting when you look at our lines, um, how, how much they go through to make sure that they are putting all the black people over here, put all 100 over here and make sure, listen, listen this is an all lily white situation, right? And so, you know, even when we look at the state of Texas, the state of Texas looks more like California demographically. But when you look at the Texas house, it's a bunch of all white men. Like that, that's who's getting elected. And so you say, now, how do you make it make sense, right? And so we have had to be on the front lines of the fight for voting rights because they realize, well, wait a minute, now too many of them are waking up and, and now they want to go vote. Now, now they want to be heard. So let's go ahead and reel them in because if Texas were to ever go blue, the White House never goes back red, right? And so what they've done is literally every 10 years, they lock in their power by cheating. And so that is one of those systemic issues and it leads to so many other things. So for instance, in the Texas house, I filed more bills than anybody else. And my weed bills, I filed more weed bills than everybody too. Now my weed bills were moving, believe it or not, Republicans, they on board too. Now they may have a different reason. They may only wanna do it because, well, they just trying to look out and get some bread for them and they homies, right? And for us, you know, they ain't trying to let us in on the bread part, but at least maybe we can get some of our people out and be smarter about who we lock up. And we're looking for um, some real justice and fairness when we're looking at it. So anyway, long story short, I was getting all these bills passed. My marijuana bills, boom, 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 boom. They coming out, right? So I'm getting them out of committee. We, we doing the thing. 
And there is this thing called calendars committee. And our speaker, who was a Republican, loaded up the calendars committee with mostly Republicans, right? Because he can do it. They're in power. But what happens? You file a bill, great. You get a hearing in committee, awesome. You get the votes to get it out of committee, man, you the bomb.com until, right? Until it goes to calendars and they can kill your bill just like that. Never makes it to the floor, never has an opportunity of actually being voted on by the entire house, let alone making it to the Senate, let alone potentially going to the governor's desk, right? For a signature. But when we look at it, what they used to tell us all the time was, well, the people of Texas put us in power. No, they really didn't. Y'all cheated, right? And so we see the fight right now, like um, as it relates to the fact that the Voting Rights Act, the, the good parts, at least the best parts, let me not say the good parts, the best parts were gutted in the 2013 decision. And so as we're fighting just to get basics back, right? We, for whatever reason, can't get the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act out of the U.S. Senate. And if we could have gotten it out of the U.S. Senate, then we would at least be assured that there would be some sort of oversight by the DOJ for racist states such as Texas who like to play racist games, right? Where they say, ah, 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 Texas, y'all playing too much. Um, you know, we grew uh, faster than any other state. And... <laughs> We only added 180,000 new Anglos. 95% of the growth was due to people of color. So we ended up with two new congressional seats. Yes, great job, Texas. Everybody's moving in. So yes, we got two new seats, right? Wrong, because what did they do? Two new Anglo seats. Now, I don't know how they did the math, right? But they're allowed to because, well, we gutted our protections that were located in the Voting Rights Act. And so these are the, like the, the systems get real deep, but all of us need to understand. And I need y'all to participate. I need y'all to lend um, a, a hand, especially as a lot of these municipalities are now going through their redistricting. Um, some of the counties are doing their redistricting. You need to go, you need to help out. You need to make sure that you're helping to train um, those people in your community to testify, give them the buzzwords. Those are the things that we need going on on the ground level so that, yeah, they've taken our power, you know, on the state level, as well as on the federal level in the state of Texas, and we're relying upon uh, these courts that have these lifetime appointments from Trump to help us out. But, right, like, we've got it, once again, it goes back to, to the local level. You've got to get in, you've got to help out, and there's so much that y'all can do because the everyday um, person doesn't know why some random racist is, is representing them. They went and they voted for the non-racist. They don't get it, right? Like they don't understand. And this is where we get the rhetoric about our vote doesn't count, right? So we gotta make them count. And it starts with trying to fix the system um, that has to do with how we apportion our representation and make sure that we're putting systems in place that allow for the people to choose who will represent them instead of the representatives choosing who it is that they are willing to represent. That is, you've touched on so many things that if we had more time tonight, I think we could have had an entire panel on redistricting and the choices that those, you know, I mean, from things to whether or not, how even redistricting occurs, never mind the actual choices that are made, whether or not you have a independent commission or whether or not like here in New Jersey where I'm from you have a completely partisan process that is yeah and so it it is an extremely important issue so we're nearing the end of our panel and I really want to ensure that all of the students who watch this tonight and who heard all of the amazing things that you had to say, as if they don't have something to do, I would like you all to give them some homework. And so on the issue that is most important in your perspective, what can we do? What should I get up and go do right now? And because you get us off on our first question, Ms. Amwaku, could you start us off once more? Uh, yeah, it's a very difficult um, answer because I, I feel like there's so many different uh, human rights issues right now that are 
are pressing. I think that one thing is to find an area that speaks to you and see how you can get involved. Um, and then another area too is we're seeing um, the importance of how the private sector and businesses um, play in a lot of different issues from human rights to environmental rights to climate change. And so uh, use the power of the purse, um, shop responsibly, but then also um, use whatever power you can to persuade these corporate actors to do better, I think is, is a key thing to do right now. All right, economic strength. That's how we first got started here in America is by making the corporations feel the pain with our boycotts and we can use that to craft the way that we support different businesses and organizations in this new global market. I mean, the power of Black spending is in the billions as a community. So we need to make sure our billions are getting us some bang for our buck. Representative Crockett, would you like to give some homework to all of our law students? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I, you know, some of it I think I'd already started uh, as I'm talking about redistricting and things like that. Also, I think it's really important, you know, um, the civil rights organizations that always had our back historically, such as NAACP, Urban League, um, Next Action Network. Um, there are so many of these organizations and your generation um, definitely is probably participating a little bit more in Black Lives Matter movement. Um, what I want to do is encourage you in general to just get involved, go and basically say, I'm here to help and do just that because we are limited on resources. Um, I remember as, as it was stated um, during the George Floyd protest, I always represent protesters pro bono. That's like a thing that I do because I say, hey, if I was to transport myself back into another time, what would my role be? And this is what I felt like I was supposed to do. So I represented over 600 protesters pro bono. But listen, I didn't realize it was going to be that many people that needed help. They, they arrested everybody. And so it took interns, it took uh, other lawyers to make sure that we got everybody's cases dropped and things like that. So make sure you're signing up and you're getting involved. Don't just sit on the sidelines and like tweet. Make sure you go and help about whoever it is that is doing something and do something for the culture because we are the talented 10th. And so we can't just take the talent part and not give back. So I just want you, whatever it is that's your passion, give to that passion right now. I promise you it will be pressed down, shaking together and running over and come back to you. Love y'all so much. Well, listen, and I would like to testify personally from experience to the power of just showing up and saying, what can I do? Yeah, that, you know, especially if you're not looking to get paid, <laughs> you know, not as a, as a people will accept some help, but on those issues that are important to your community and getting people together, people love to see people trying to help. All right, Ms. Robinson, can you take us home with some amazing homework? Yes, your first assignment ASAP is go get the book strength finder and read it it's a short book you can read it in a weekend all studies show that the most successful people have identified their strength and they're operating in it spending your time trying to get good at what you're not that great at is a waste of time you should be spending your time identifying your strengths and talents that's your first homework. You have an obligation to identify your talent. It was given to you. You were born with it. Once you figure out that talent, your second obligation is to share it with the world. You are in law school. You are going to graduate with a law degree. It is one of the most powerful tools that you can have to work on behalf of other people who don't have that power. Use that strength, however it shows up, whether it's to be a leader, whether it's to be an operations person, whether it's to be a visionary, whether it's to be an executor, an implementer, an organizer, it doesn't matter. Combine it with your law degree and go help someone. That is why you are here. If you do those two things, figure out your talent and share it with the world, the world will be better for it and you will be better for it. 
Well, I think all of our members are going to be quite busy with all that introspection and finding their talent and getting involved in the community and holding people accountable. We've got a lot to do in order to empower and advance our communities through social and civic engagement. And thank you, Terrell. You facilitated and hosted an awesome piano. Great job. Thank you to all of our panelists for making this an amazing panel, for providing such amazing insight, and for being willing to come and take this time out of their day, out of their very busy, impactful lives, to come lay some magic and impact on us. So this is the end of our panel. Once more, thank you to all of you guys who came out tonight and joined us. And yes, see, we've got so many people excited in the chat. Shout out all of you. Once more, my name is Terrell. I'm our Director of Advocacy and External Initiatives. And that's our panel. I hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you for joining us. Have and a good night. I Go be great. All, yes. I hope we all meet soon again. Take Thanks care, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye.